In this lesson, we will discuss perfect numbers, Mersenne primes, and Fermat primes. Let's begin by talking about perfect numbers. One of the things the ancient Greeks did was to classify integers according to whether the sum of their proper divisors was less than that number, equal to that number, or greater than that number. So the proper divisors are all divisors except for the number itself. So three classifications were whether the this sum was less than n, equal to n, and or greater than n. So I have three different names for these. So let's use our sigma notation, our sigma function. So if the sum of the proper divisors was less than n, then sigma of n would be less than 2n, and they called n deficient. If sigma of n was greater than 2n, in other words, the sum of its proper divisors was greater than n, then, we, then n was called abundant. And of particular interest is when the sum of the proper divisors equals n, they call those perfect numbers. So if sigma of n equals 2n, then n is called perfect. So let's give some examples of perfect numbers. Six which equals one plus two plus three is the smallest perfect number. The next perfect number is 28. Is 28 equals one plus two plus four plus seven plus 14. 496 is also a perfect number equals one plus two plus 4, plus 8, plus 16, plus 31, plus 62, plus 124, plus 248. Then there's a big jump to the next perfect number. 8,128 is also a perfect number. And the Greeks knew of these four perfect numbers. And the ancient Greeks actually even proved some theorems about per perfect numbers. The next theorem about even perfect numbers was first proved by Euclid. N is an even perfect number. If and only if n equals 
2 to the power of p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1 where p and 2 to the p minus 1 are prime numbers. So the easier of the two directions is the reverse implication. So let's begin there. So I'm going to suppose p and 2 to the p minus 1 are both, are both prime. And I'm going to show that this n is a perfect number. Then for n, which is can be defined as 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1, let's look at sigma of n. We want to show that sigma of n equals 2n. Well, sigma of n, by the definition of n, is sigma of 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1. And notice that 2 to the p minus 1 is even. It's a power of 2. And 2 to the p minus 1 is odd, so therefore those numbers are relatively prime. And by the multiplicative nature of sigma, this will equal sigma of 2 to the p minus 1 times sigma of 2 to the p minus 1. We know the formula for the sigma function. We know that a prime power 2 to the p minus 1, sigma of 2 to the p minus 1 will be 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared all the way up to 2 to the p minus 1. And since 2 to the p minus 1 is prime, the only divisors will be 1 and 2 to the p minus 1. So that would be sigma of 2 to the p minus 1. Now on the left hand, the left factor, I can rewrite as 2 to the power p minus 1 over 2 minus 1 using the finite geometric series formula. And then the factor on the right, 1 plus 2 to the p minus 1, the plus 1 and the minus 1 cancels, and I just get 2 to the p. This equals 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p. If you look at this, this looks just like n, except I have an extra factor of 2. So this is equal to 2n. Thus, n is perfect. Clearly, n is even. Now I'll prove the forward implication. So I'm going to assume that n is an even perfect number. Since n is even, I can let me pull all the factors of 2 out. And so I'm going to let n equal 2 to the k minus 1 times, I'm going to call it n0, n sub 0. Where k is going to be an integer greater than or equal to 2. And now n0 has no factors of 2 in it. So n0 is odd. Well, since n sub 0 is odd, the greatest common divisor of 2 to the k minus 1 and n0 is 1.
then we can use the multiplicative nature of the sigma function to write sigma of n as sigma of 2 to the k minus 1 times n sub 0. And since these factors are relatively prime, this is sigma of 2 to the k minus 1 times sigma of n0. And by the formula for sigma of a prime power, this will equal 2 to the power of k minus 1 times sigma of n sub 0. Now we know that n is perfect, so sigma of n equals 2n. So since n is perfect, sigma of n equals 2n, and we can rewrite n again as 2 to the k times n0. Then combining the two equations, we see that that 2 to the power of k minus 1 times sigma of n0 will have to equal 2 to the k times n0. Now look at this equation. So we we see that 2 to the k minus 1 divides the integer 2 to the k times n0. But 2 to the k and 2 to the k minus 1 are consecutive integers and therefore relatively prime. So we can deduce that 2 to the k minus 1 actually divides n0. Since 2 to the k minus 1 and 2 to the k are consecutive integers. The greatest common divisor of 2 to the k minus 1 and 2 to the k must be 1 Thus, from the previous equation, we see that 2 to the k minus 1 actually divides n0. So by definition of divides, we can write n0 as an integer times 2 to the k minus 1. I'm going to write it as 2 to the k minus 1. I'm going to call it n times n1 for some integer n1. Then from above, we have 2 to the k minus 1 times sigma of n0. That equals 2 to the k times n0, but I'm going to replace n0 with 2 to the k minus 1 times n1. And from this equation, if we divide both sides by 2 to the k minus 1, we get that sigma of n sub 0 equals 2 to the power of k times n1. Now, we know that n1 is a divisor of n0, but n0 is also a divisor of n0. Okay, So since n0 and n1 are divisors of n0.
and their sum is n0 plus n1, but n0 is 2 to the k minus 1 times n1 plus n1. So if I expand this, I get this equals 2 to the k times n1. You have a, a plus n1 and a minus n1 that cancel out. But this, we saw, is equal to sigma of n0. So the sum of the divisors of n0, which by definition is sigma of n0, equals n0 plus n1. So therefore, n0 and n1 must be all of the divisors of n0. So it must be that n0 and n1 are the only divisors of n0. But this implies that n0 must be prime. So n0 is prime and n1 would therefore have to equal 1. So n0 is prime and n1 equals 1. Then n0 equals 2 to the k minus 1 time, which is times n1. We'll just simplify to 2 to the k minus 1 times 1, or just 2 to the k minus 1. Then n0 equals 2 to the k minus 1 is prime. But the only way for 2 to the k minus 1 to be prime is for k to be prime as well. But 2 to the k minus 1 is prime only if k is prime. Why is that true? Because suppose k is composite. Okay? Because if k is composite, then we can write k as L times M for some integers L and M. where L is greater than one, is less than or equal to M, is less than or equal to K. And then I could rewrite two to the K minus one as two to the L minus one times the factor two to the L times M minus one plus 2 to the L times M minus 2 all the way down to 2 to the L plus 1. And this demonstrates that 2 to the K minus 1 would be composite. So we see that n0 is 2 to the k minus 1, which is prime, and the only way for that to be prime is if k is prime. So this finishes the theorem about even perfect numbers. So every even perfect number looks like 2 to the power of p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1, where p is prime, and 2 to the p minus 1 is prime. 
So we saw in the study of perfect numbers that numbers of the form 2 to the p minus 1, where p is prime, play an important role. So this gives rise to the following definition of Mersenne primes. So a prime number of the form two to the p minus one, where p is also a prime, is called a Mersenne prime. So these primes were named after the 17th century French scholar Marin Mersenne. who studied these numbers in the 17th century. He actually compiled an incorrect list of these primes with exponents up to 257. And we see that these primes are connected with per perfect numbers because if we can find a Mersenne prime, two to the p minus one, then we could find a perfect number. which will equal 2 to the p minus 1 times the Mersenne prime 2 to the p minus 1. So finding perfect numbers is essentially the same as finding Mersenne primes. So the largest Mersenne prime and also the largest prime known to date This is July 2014. It's actually given the name M48 for the 48th Mersenne prime found. M48, which equals 2 to the power 57,885,161 minus 1. which has 17,425,170 digits. And it was found by the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Search, which is abbreviated GIMPs. And this is a, a network of volunteers who download free software to their PCs and in the spare time, the computers will verify if these numbers are prime. And so these, this network of computers coordinates to search for Mersenne primes. So this was found by the great internet Mersen Prime Search. And so anyone can can join the search for Mersen Primes. All you have to do is 
go to the website mersen.org so for more information or download the software see mersen.org and they have a list of the, the known Mersen primes and they can you can find you can see when they were found so this latest prime M48 was found I believe in 2013 and since this is this is the largest Mersenne prime and it's also the largest prime known to date and one of the contemporaries of Mersenne was Pierre de Fermat we've heard his name before when we talk about Fermat's little theorem and both of these uh, f French scholars were were working in the 17th century studying properties of primes and and so this kind of leads to another topic uh, called Fermat primes So again, these were studied by first by Fermat in the uh, 17th century. So we're going to call a prime number of the form two to the power two to the n plus one. We're going to call these Fermat primes. So in the 1600s, Fermat conjectured that all these numbers of this form are prime since it was true for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So Fermat conjectured that the numbers, sometimes called Fermat numbers, Fn, which is 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 are prime since this is true for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3 and four but several decades later Euler proved in 1739 that F5 is not prime So Fermat, Fermat's conjecture was wrong, um, but it's often the case when people have, even if they have an incorrect conjecture about primes or integers in general, something can be, something good can come out of this. And it was actually 200 years later that Gauss was working on a problem from the ancient Greeks about constructing regular polygons. And the Fermat primes actually came up in his proof So, 200 years later, Gauss actually proved that a regular n-gon, so a regular polygon with n sides, can be constructed. with a compass and straight edge
if and only if n factors as 2 to the power k times f sub n1 all the way up to f sub nr where each of these f's are distinct from all primes. So thereby solving one of the questions that the ancient Greeks were interested in solving 2,000 years ago.